We're on page 307 in the lecture outline, and we now want to examine how oxygen and carbon dioxide are transported in the bloodstream. We're going to start with the transport of oxygen. The first picture we're going to look at, however, is on page 310. We're looking at page 310, and at the bottom of 310, there is a picture showing the alveoli of the lungs and a pulmonary capillary carrying blood right past these alveoli. We know that the normal amount of oxygen in the lungs, breathing at a normal rate in a normal healthy person, the normal oxygen in the alveoli is about 100 millimeters of mercury or 100 torr. That's called the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli of the lungs. The oxygen is going to diffuse out of the alveoli into the bloodstream, diffusing down its concentration gradient. The oxygen initially diffuses into the plasma, but the majority of oxygen will then enter the red blood cells and attach or bind to the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells. The hemoglobin binds oxygen very vigorously, such that uh, the hemoglobin becomes 98% saturated with oxygen. What that means is that the hemoglobin in the red blood cells is carrying just about all the oxygen it is capable of carrying or transporting, just again by breathing normal air at a normal rate uh, with a normal partial pressure of oxygen of 100 millimeters of mercury or torr. If we measure the amount of oxygen in 100 milliliters of blood that has gone through the lungs, we would find that in 100 milliliters of blood, there is about a half a milliliter of oxygen dissolved in the plasma. The majority of oxygen, 19.5 milliliters, is found inside the red blood cells. Well, if there's a half a milliliter of oxygen dissolved in the plasma and 19.5 milliliters of oxygen inside the red blood cells, then 0.5 plus 19.5 is a total of 20 milliliters of oxygen is normally found in every 100 milliliters of blood that has gone through the lungs. This is also referred to as 20 milliliters percent oxygen, percent referring to per 100 milliliters. This is commonly referred to as the volume percent oxygen of the blood. So we see that there are three numbers uh, related to uh, the oxygen. There is the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and uh, in the blood plasma of 100 millimeters of mercury or torr. There is a total of 20 milliliters of oxygen in every 100 milliliters of blood. And we also said, number three, that the hemoglobin is about 98% fully loaded up or saturated with oxygen. That's called the percent saturation of the hemoglobin uh, with oxygen. If we now return back to page 308, this is page 308. Uh, we remind you that oxygen can reversibly combine with hemoglobin. When oxygen is not attached to the hemoglobin, the uh, hemoglobin is a dark red, uh, almost a reddish black. Uh, it's referred to as deoxyhemoglobin, which literally means without oxygen. When the oxygen attaches to hemoglobin, uh, the hemoglobin loads up uh, with the oxygen, forming oxyhemoglobin, which is a very bright scarlet, a bright red. That's known as oxyhemoglobin. This is a reversible reaction. On page 309, we point out that there are two principal factors that affect the amount of oxygen carried by the red blood cells. Number one, the hemoglobin content inside the red blood cells. There are different types of anemia where the person doesn't make enough uh, of the normal hemoglobin inside the red blood cells, and therefore the red blood cell is not capable of transporting the normal amount of oxygen within it. One of the things that's commonly measured in the blood is the amount of hemoglobin in every 100 milliliters of blood. And normally there's 15 grams of hemoglobin in every 100 milliliters of blood. We could also write that as 15%, 15% uh, hemoglobin. The second factor that can affect the amount of oxygen carried by the red blood cells is the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli of the uh, lungs. This graph is showing the relationship between 
the partial pressure of oxygen and what percent of that hemoglobin has oxygen attached or bound to it. And it has the famous S-shaped curve relationship. Basically, what this means is that hemoglobin very much wants to bind or attach oxygen to it normally. In fact, just to point out a, a couple of things, when the partial pressure of oxygen is 40, uh, the uh, hemoglobin is about 75%, 75% saturated or loaded up with oxygen. When the partial pressure of oxygen is about 60 millimeters of mercury, the uh, hemoglobin is about 90% saturated or loaded up with oxygen. Now, we know that the normal partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolar of the lungs is 100, and with a partial pressure of 100, the hemoglobin is, as we've said, about 98% saturated uh, with oxygen. And that's pretty close to 100%, so it's carrying just about all the oxygen it possibly can. If the partial pressure of oxygen were to decrease in the alveoli of the lungs, uh, let's say it dropped from the normal 100 down to 60, nevertheless, the hemoglobin in the red blood cells would still be about 90% uh, saturated or loaded up uh, with oxygen uh, relative to their uh, total capacity to carry oxygen. This is page uh, 311, and here we've simply pointed out that when the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and systemic arterial blood is 100 millimeters of mercury, which it normally is, there is about a half a milliliter of oxygen dissolved in the plasma and 19.5 milliliters of oxygen bound or carried within the red blood cell attached to the hemoglobin, or a total of 20 milliliters of oxygen in every 100 milliliters of oxygenated blood. This is the uh, bottom of page 311 in the lecture outline, and we just described uh, how strongly hemoglobin binds oxygen as the blood flows through past the alveoli in the lungs. But that raises an interesting question. If the hemoglobin within the red blood cells does bind oxygen so strongly in the lungs, then why would the hemoglobin release that oxygen? Why would it let go of that oxygen so that it can diffuse out of the red blood cell and be available to the tissues of the body? Well, the answer to that as to what makes the hemoglobin actually let go of the oxygen is that there are a number of factors that actually cause the hemoglobin to release that oxygen. The, these are factors that decrease the affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen. We've indicated three of these factors. Uh, uh, there are other factors as well. We wrote that anytime there's a local increase in carbon dioxide level, or a local increase in acidity, hydrogen ion level, or an increase in temperature. These three factors will cause changes in the molecular conformation of the hemoglobin, causing the hemoglobin to let go or unload that oxygen and make it available to the tissues. Now, in fact, all three of these factors tend to occur in any metabolically active tissue, such as at muscles, that are actively exercising and using up oxygen. Because as the rate of cellular respiration increases in a metabolically active tissue, such as exercising muscle, the muscle is giving off CO2, carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide uh, is reacting with water to form carbonic acid, which is increasing the acidity. In addition, the muscle may even be forming lactic acid that's increasing the acidity. And we also know that the increased rate of cellular respiration in the muscle uh, gives off heat. We know that over half the energy uh, released from the breaking apart of sugars to make ATP goes off as heat. So all three of these factors tend to occur in a very active tissue, and these three factors cause the hemoglobin to let go of that oxygen and make it available to that tissue. We have a picture of this. Here we have a picture on page 312. It, here it shows a tissue cell. Perhaps it's a muscle cell or some other cell in the body. It is uh, carrying on cellular respiration. 
It is giving off carbon dioxide. That uh, carbon dioxide is also turning into carbonic acid as it reacts with water. It, that cell may also be generating lactic acid. It is also giving off heat from the rate of cellular respiration. And these factors, this release of carbon dioxide in the blood, this increase in acids in the blood, this increase in temperature of the blood, are all causing the hemoglobin in the red blood cell to unload that oxygen, to release that oxygen to that muscle cell so that it's available for cellular respiration. So the three major factors that cause the hemoglobin to release or unload that oxygen are the increased CO2, the increased acidity, and the increased temperature. Now, interestingly, these three factors go in the reverse direction in the lungs. In the bloodstream of the pulmonary capillaries, carbon dioxide is actually flowing out of the bloodstream into the alveoli of the lungs, lowering the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. There is a decrease in amount of acid, including carbonic acid, and there's a decrease in temperature. These three factors actually cause an increase in affinity between hemoglobin and oxygen, such that hemoglobin binds oxygen more vigorously, and there is a loading up of the uh, oxygen by the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. This is shown in the picture at the bottom. Here is carbon dioxide in the bloodstream of the pulmonary capillaries diffusing into the alveolus or air sacs in the lungs. This actually causes bicarbonate to react with hydrogen ion in the blood forming carbonic acid, disassociating into CO2 and water to allow more carbon dioxide to diffuse into the bloodstream. Obviously, this is resulting in a decrease in carbonic acid. Uh, furthermore, there is a loss of heat from the bloodstream into the lungs. So again, this decrease in carbon dioxide, decrease in carbonic acid, decrease in temperature actually increase the affinity hemoglobin has for oxygen and increases the loading up of oxygen by the hemoglobin within the red blood cells. This is page 319 in the lecture outline. We're looking at a lab form from a hospital specifically dealing with pulmonary function. And I want to show you the terms that we've been talking about, how they appear on this particular lab form. We, of course, have learned that the normal amount of oxygen uh, in the alveoli and uh, dissolved in the oxygenated blood has a partial pressure of about 100 millimeters of mercury or 100 torr. That's called the partial pressure of oxygen. We also see right here that it indicates the oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin. We have learned that a normal person breathing air at a normal rate, uh, their hemoglobin becomes about 98% fully saturated with oxygen as the red blood cells flow through the lungs. So here we've indicated the normal oxygen saturation is about 98%. And according to this hospital, it should certainly be greater than 96%. Now, we've also learned that the total amount of oxygen found in every 100 milliliters of oxygenated blood is about 20 milliliters of... This is called the volume percent oxygen. So the normal volume of oxygen uh, found in every 100 milliliters of oxygenated blood is 20 milliliters of oxygen.